materialistic motivation. Christian leaders, in particular, must be on guard against the temptation to be motivated by materialistic interests. Here's Gene. At this point in the letter, the Apostle Paul wants Timothy to understand more fully. He wants Timothy to understand more fully what motivated these false teachers. And basically, to net it out, it was materialism. It was power, but it was money. And by the way, that rings true universally when it comes to people with improper motives. And so Paul goes on to say, Timothy, if anyone teaches false doctrine and does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that promotes godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but has an unhealthy interest in disputes and arguments over words. From these, that is, from these conceited attitudes and from these disputes and these arguments, from these will come envy and quarreling and slander and evil suspicions and constant disagreement among people whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. And that's interesting because here he's not talking about true godliness. He's talking about basically religion and utilizing concepts of godliness to teach that you can get rich. And this is God's plan for your life. And so go for it. And don't hesitate to take advantage of people materially. And that's what these false teachers were doing. The basic motive of what they were doing was to utilize religion in order to lead these people astray and in the process to become wealthy. Well, Paul goes on to explain what he's talking about. He said, but godliness with contentment is great gain. This is something, Timothy, these people need to learn. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge people in to ruin and destruction. And then he summarizes it. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs." Now get the context. Paul is saying money is not the problem. It's the love of money. And you'll notice the words that he uses here, craving it. This is why they live. They crave it. They're materialistic. Money has become their God. He's not saying money's evil. It's the love of money. And the love of money here is a very intense motivating factor. And he says that's what's driving these false teachers. And Timothy, make sure that as elders and leaders there, you don't fall into that trap. Avoid that. Avoid that trap. And let me just simply say, Paul is not saying it's wrong to make money. He's not saying that. This is not what he's dealing with. He's dealing with making money a god. He's dealing with substituting wealth for God. That's what he's dealing with here. He's not saying, in our culture, if your boss calls you in and said, you know, I've been watching you. You're doing a great job. In fact, you're doing such a great job, I'm going to double your salary. Paul is not saying you should say, oh, no, no. Don't double my salary. Uh, I don't need that money. Uh, that's not what Paul's saying. As we'll see, what Paul is saying is, thank God, because if I have more than I need, I'll be able to build the kingdom of God. He's dealing here with making money an idol. In essence, he's saying what uh, Jesus really said 
uh, when he said, and I'll, I'll move to Matthew 6.33, but I want to come back to a reference uh, in the book of Acts. Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you as well. In other words, it's a matter of priorities in our lives. Now, where did this attitude come from in Ephesus? Well, I, as I was thinking about that, my mind went back to the condition and the situation in Ephesus when Paul came there to establish a church. Remember, he spent three years there. And he got into serious trouble preaching the gospel because what happened was that he cut right into the profits of some of the people who were making money in terms of pagan worship. We read about that in Acts 19.24. For a person named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. When he had assembled them, as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, he said, Men, you know that our prosperity... Now that's not living, our living. He's talking about prosperity, wealth. Men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this man Paul has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hand are not gods. You see, this was part of the culture that the gospel penetrated. And so it makes a lot of sense that that kind of culture is going to permeate the environment even when the gospel comes and creates the church of Jesus Christ, you'll see men like Demetrius, others who say, we can take advantage of that. We can use that to make wealth for ourselves. And so it shouldn't surprise us that this was a very significant problem there in Ephesus. Here's a question for reflection and response. In terms of this principle, what are some specific indicators in our own culture that even many Christians love money more than living in the will of God? Well, first of all, I'd like to deal with the direct application of religious leaders, because we have that in our culture. We have false teachers today in our culture, and unfortunately, they can permeate people's lives through the mass media. And they're using Christianity as a means of getting rich. Shouldn't surprise us. They're all over the place. And what makes it even more insidious? They're using biblical terminology. They're talking about Jesus. They're talking about faith. They're talking about the new birth. But undergirding much of what they're doing is a materialistic motive. And it's shameful, sinful. So you see, it wasn't just the New Testament problem. We have that problem in our culture today. And what, as I said, made it really dangerous, they camouflaged their greed by using biblical language. And one of the false doctrines that they're using is that, really, God wants you to be rich. God wants you to have the biggest car. God wants you to have two cars, three cars. God wants you to have a bigger house. God wants you to have wealth. You're a child of God. And nowhere in the New Testament is that taught. The interesting thing, isn't it interesting that the apostles probably all died poor. And they gave everything. They gave their lives. And they didn't get rich. That alone demonstrates contradiction to that false teaching. So we have this false motivation even today. But let's just get personal. It affects us too. We live in a materialistic culture. And if we're not careful, it can impact all of us as well. And one of the ways it can impact, uh, impact us is we just don't put God in our budget. He's just not there. If 
we have leftovers, you know, we'll do something for God. But he's not at the top in terms of priority. And so times get tough, who gets left out? Well, he's not there in the first place. So consequently, what we can give, God gets left out. Now there are crises beyond our control, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about our lifestyle. Uh, in some respects, many respects, if we're not careful, we'll budget around our wants rather than our needs. Now, God's not against our wants, but if we budget around that first, we're not seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. As Jesus said, that should be our priority. And then all these things will be added to us as well. And God may bless us materially. I believe He does. But if our motivation is based on that premise, it's not proper motivation. And so, let me just state that principle again. And Christian leaders, in particular, must be on guard against the temptation to be motivated by materialistic interests. But as we've seen, that principle certainly applies to all of us who follow Jesus Christ.